hi everyone, good to see all of you, um, or at least see your names if you're not on video. Uh, we're in for a real treat today. I'm really excited about this presentation. And I wanted to take a moment to just sort of formally introduce Marissa, because I know many of you maybe haven't had the opportunity yet to meet her, um, so now you can at least do it virtually. So Marissa Hershon joined the Ringling as curator of Cotizon and Decorative Arts in May 2019. So she's been here about a year now. Um, and her purview includes overseeing the collection of decorative arts, which numbers over 6,000 objects across the Cotizon, the Museum of Art, and the modern and contemporary glass in the Cot Kotler Colvo Glass Pavilion. She also manages historic preservation projects at the Cotizon. Marissa has worked in the art museum field for over 15 years and received her BA in art history at Tulane University and an MA in history of decorative arts at the Smithsonian Corcoran College of Art and Design. So with that, I'm really appreciative of Marissa taking the time to be with us today. And Marissa, I'm gonna just turn it over to you. Um, and if you are one of our participants, if you wouldn't mind just muting yourselves, um, if you have questions that come up during the, the presentation, feel free to send them to the chat and I can relay them to Marissa and we will leave plenty of time at the end for other questions. So Marissa, take it away. Great, thank you, Laura. Thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm excited to do my first Zoom Coffee with a Curator. So um, we're going to be looking at a preview of an upcoming rotation of postcards from the Ringling Archives. There will be two six-week rotations installed at the Cotizon over the summer. And this is an ongoing research project. I've been working in collaboration with our chief archivist, Heidi Connor, as well as our assistant archivist, Susan O'Shea. They um, have been wonderful, supportive, and collegial colleagues and I couldn't have done this without them. So I wanted to first thank them. They are currently cataloging and digitizing our collection of postcards and we have hundreds and hundreds of these. And um, so we're still figuring out um, a lot of the details about them, but as we continue to catalog these, we will be putting them online on our website in the future as an archives module on eMuseum, where you can explore the Ringling's collection online. And as we are able to expand access digitally, we will share the news of those developments. So you may have recently read our first digital members magazine that came out in May. And uh, I was happy to include a brief introduction to the postcards from the past installation there. And with everything going on due to um, the closure, due to COVID-19, even though we're now reopened, we're um, planning to install these in the next week or so. Um, and I'll announce it on our social media so you can know when to come in. They'll be installed in two cases in the foyer of Cotizon. And we're going to look at a selection of our postcards today from both of these rotations coming up. And um, just to give you a little background on where we are with this, I was really excited to learn that we have all these postcards in the archives and spent a lot of time looking at the imagery and the details and the clues about what these postcards can tell us about the historic landscape, about the tourism industry. These date from uh, the 1920s to the 1950s primarily, and they were widely available as inexpensive tour souvenirs. But today they're actually a really valuable resource for people like me, um, curators, historians, professors, academics, who are exploring the past through visual culture. And um, we have a selection of both linen postcards and uh, real photograph postcards, and I'll explain those different types to you as well. But uh, before we look into all these examples, I just wanted to step back and give you a little bit of background on how I first came to be interested in postcards. So several years ago when I worked at the Chrysler Museum of Art in Norfolk, Virginia, I was researching their glass collection for a major publication on masterpieces in the collection, as well as a reinstallation and redesign of their glass galleries. And one of the hallmarks of that collection is this Tiffany window 
that is a beautiful triptych that came out of a historic mansion on Long Island that was unfortunately demolished in the 1960s. So as I was researching the architectural context for this commission, I came across lots of these postcards that give a sense of that landscape that no longer survives. And I circled the area where this window was installed on that postcard there to show you it was right above the entry in the foyer of that home. And I learned about these postcards from a very helpful architectural historian, Gary Lawrence. These were in his private collection and he was so nice to share them with me. And I got to see all of these views of this huge estate and this uh, French neoclassical revival home that was this monument to excess and was full of a variety of eclectic design and art and furniture that all was dispersed through auctions. And that's how Walter Chrysler likely acquired the window. So this was one of my first forays into looking at postcards in addition to period literature, auction records, design drawings, uh, and so forth. These were a wonderful way to supplement all of that research. And I also uh, previously lived in Houston, Texas for a number of years and worked at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston and was a member of Preservation Houston, a local organization. And they brought in a lot of speakers and I was very excited to hear the author of a recent book that came out in 2016, Postcard America. Um, that was all about Kurt Tyke and his postcard company in Chicago. And most of our postcards at the Ringling were by this company. It was one of the leading producers of postcards. Uh, it was founded in 1898. So this is a really great resource if you're interested in digging deeper into postcards and their history. And this is where I uh, started a lot of my research as well as there are numerous articles and publications out there on postcards. This is actually a really big area of interdisciplinary academic research. So while these may seem like simple common pieces of postcards, they're actually really useful um, for history to American research. And you know, these, you're seeing them on the screen and so they're obviously amplified, but um, you can see this is the one, how tiny it is. It's just three and a half by five and a half, just to give you a sense. These are tiny. I'm sure you already know this, but just to <laughs> give you, an idea that these are small pieces of paper. And um, while we're looking at this screen, I just want to point out the linen postcards. And you'll see that texture on the cardstock more clearly in some images than others, but there's a embossed texture on the surface uh, that was part of the printing process. And that's why they were given the name linen postcards because that texture uh, resembles fabric. But, um, just as I study decorative arts and architectural history, I also study material culture, the everyday objects of life. And so postcards fall into that arena. And in case any of you are wondering, postcards are still everywhere. They were produced in the millions and they were originally available on every corner drugstore like Woolworths. They were um, sold very widely and you could buy them individually or as packs. And so um, you can look at them now and find them even on eBay and other sites like that. But these are really widely available still to this day. And the reason why they became so popular was hand in hand with the development of the tourism industry in Florida. So as travel by personal car became more widely prominent and available and the growth of development of Sarasota as a tourist destination also became more, more well known. Postcards uh, were produced hand in hand with that. And they're really um, wonderful to look at in terms of the printing technology as well as the historic landscapes they document because a number of places that we'll look at uh, in Sarasota either have changed dramatically with continued development or are no longer in existence um, due to demolition. So these are wonderful documents for us to look back in time. 
And um, in case any of you are curious, there are some digitized postcards at Florida Memories website if you want to continue to explore looking at the variety online. So here is an example of the linen postcard side by side with the real photo postcards. And I just want to point out how this imagery came about. So Kurt Teich and Company used a sophisticated multiple color and printing process where they would take an original source photo um, and the one you see on the left is likely based on a, the photo on the right. They would either send out photographers across the country to take photos in different locales or they would have commissions with photographs submitted by clients to turn them into postcards. And then they would have an art coloring department where they would be given instructions on what colors to use. And they had certain color palettes available at the time, um, but they would also add and subtract details such as removing people from scenes, adding cloud formations in the sky, and change the colors, sometimes quite dramatically. So here you can see this uh, waterfront aerial view of Katazan, that red tile roof is really intensified and exaggerated. And if you've seen Katazan in person, like most of you have, you know that this is much brighter than it probably appeared in real life, but it's part of the allure of these images. And um, we'll look at some of these alterations in closer detail. But just for reference, all the postcards we're looking at today are from the Ringling's archives and collections within, unless um, otherwise noted. So in terms of dating postcards, we know linen postcards were produced from about 1931 into the 1950s, and that's the general time frame these were made. Um, but when we have a postmarked postcard, like the one seen here, and it has a legible postmark date on it, we can then determine exactly when it was mailed. And so that can help us in dating them. And there's also um, an archives for Kurt Tyke and Company in Illinois that has documented thousands of these unique views that were made by the company. And as we continue to catalog our collection, we'll be looking at that resource to better date ours, but this is still an ongoing research process. So I don't have the dates listed for a lot of these at the moment, but that's the general time frame. And the correspondence that we see on these postcards is to me a really fascinating and charming aspect of these. This one has a short note on it that says, nice little shack. I hope to go through it tomorrow. So it's a real fun way to see into what people were saying about these places as they were tourists in the area. So here are a few samples of postcards in our collection that show the historic landscape and architecture of Sarasota. And some of you may be familiar with these buildings. Um, hotels were often featured on postcards. These are no longer in existence now though. And I just wanna point out on the upper right, the John Ringling Hotel. This was originally the El Vernona and it was um, designed by Dwight James Baum, the architect of Cotizan in the Mediterranean revival style. And John Ringling um, bought it and changed the name. But um, unfortunately the building deteriorated over time and while preservationists tried to save it, it was torn down in the 1990s. So postcards like this are wonderful documents of the architectural history of the area. And also roadside views are a wonderful way to look into this moment at mid-century where you can see Gulfstream Avenue is depicted below um, the hotel image. And it looks quite lush and exotic and wild at the time. And we all live, who live in Sarasota know that this is a much more developed area with many buildings now. But uh, just to give you a little more context of this period, you know, we're seeing these beautiful color images and vibrant photos um, based on vibrant images of the area. Um, but what was going on at this time, you know, 
um, in the 1920s, there was a Florida land boom in this area and John Ringling was a big part of trying to make Sarasota a destination. Uh, and then unfortunately the depression hit. So there was a huge economic downturn. And then um, after that, World War II occurred. So there's a lot of complex things going on during this time, but these rosy pictures of Sarasota are trying to attract visitors, are trying to boost the economy. And they're showing you um, typical scenes that are trying to show how attractive Sarasota is, even though in reality, the economy is struggling to get back on its feet. Here are a few more views of Sarasota. We have another aerial view and a main street view. These were very typical for cities to have these across the country. And then unique uh, tourist attractions like um, Sarasota's became the winter quarters for the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. So this was something that Sarasota wanted to promote to attract people to come and check this out. It's a way to boost the economy. Also, the homes of the rich and famous were a typical subject matter for postcards during this time as a way to show the beautiful and distinctive residential architecture of cities. And here you see a postcard of Charles Ringling's residence, which is just next door to John Ringling. So if we look at this aerial view that's meant to be um, an advertisement for tourists to the Ringling Museum of Art. Here you see the Cadizan and then Charles Ringling's home and then his daughter's home. So if you look at this postcard, this area has changed quite a bit since this. This is probably from the 1930s or 40s. There's a lot more development up here as 41 um, goes by this area. So in terms of postcards of prominent estates, um, the John Ringling Mansion um, Cartesan was featured on a number of postcards in this time uh, before it became available to be viewed by the public as part of the museum, but also once it was available to be visited as a historic house museum, postcards proliferated from this time. And this was just one of many different kinds of scenes of postcards. You can find postcards of train stations, libraries, city halls, theaters, all kinds of architecture, um, schools, post offices, courthouses, this was all um, part of a way to promote a city and its um, unique architecture. So these kinds of images um, would be based on an original photograph taken and then sent up to the uh, postcard producing firm, in this case, Kurt Tyke and Company. And then they would take that monotone image and create a very vibrant, colorful scene based on instructions. So um, here you see the pool in front of Cotizan as well as the gatehouse. And while the pool looks very much the same now that it's been restored recently, the gatehouse has changed quite a bit um, in terms of there's new architecture right behind it now in terms of our visitor center and the Kotler Coval Glass Pavilion. So this is a wonderful record of how you once could drive through that gatehouse to enter the property when um, you're a visitor of the museum. I did just see a question pop up. Um, were there postcards of Palms Elysian? Yes, there are postcards of the house that existed on this property before the Ringlings bought it and as they resided there that note that this was the John Ringling residence. And I don't have any images of those in this PowerPoint presentation, but we do have those in the archives. So this is a wonderful early postcard of the Cabazon. And this is actually one of my favorite images. <laughs> And we have one in the archives, but this is um, a beautiful one from a private collection in Sarasota. 
And I particularly love this image because I feel like the soft velvety texture of it hovers somewhere between the realism of a photograph and the imaginative license that's taken by an artist working in watercolor or in a pastel drawing. And for the now anonymous colorists that were churning out these postcards, working far away from the actual sites, it's just really amazing to me to think that they could be given instructions and then create this beautiful image, probably having never seen this in person and only looking at an original black and white source image um, to go on. But for the many US travelers and foreign travelers coming to Sarasota at this time, images like this were shaping their perceptions. And this one has those fine gradations of tone that look like watercolor washes because of the photomechanical process that was used, the colotype. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail about that, but this was um, a type of printmaking that developed in the mid 19th century. And this company, the Albertite company that was based in Brooklyn, New York, got its name from the Australian Joseph Albert, who developed this improvement on the color type in the 1860s and called it the Albertite. And it was a more expensive process than the lithography that we're seeing in the Kurt Tyke um, companies postcards. So there may not be actually as many of these that were in circulation and survive, but it's interesting to see the back of this postcard has a handwritten note on it that says, Mr. and Mrs. John Ringling acknowledge with thanks your Christmas greeting. So the Ringlings themselves apparently were using these postcards um, to write thank you notes, which to me is absolutely fascinating and is something worthy of further exploration. And just as a side note, we have a number of wonderful Christmas greetings and holiday greetings and New Year's greetings in the archives at the Ringlings that were all sent to John and Mabel Ringling in the 1920s and 1930s. And they are wonderful examples of Art Deco design and custom designed uh, greeting cards that were sent to them from friends and family and business associates all over the US and internationally. A number are from circus performers. And so we had our first uh, annual rotation of these back in December at the Cotizan. And here I'm just showing you one of the cases that these were on view in. And we've been exploring these, uh, one of our FSU uh, students and interns this past year, Mimi Hand, helped me with a lot of research into recreating the Ringling social network. So correspondence can be actually highly helpful in trying to reconstruct who the Ringlings um, were friends with and socialized with. And here is the postcard an example of it from our archives collection. You can see this one is postmarked 1928. And um, this is one of our earliest postcards that we have. So there are many different views of the Cotizan featured in postcards. And here are just a couple. And I just wanna point out the different colorways that you see um, that were being used by Kurt Tyke's company in Chicago, as well as a number of competitors and some might say imitators <laughs> across the US. So um, EC Crop Company out of Milwaukee uh, was one of the other leading companies at the time. And we have a number produced by this uh, company. And I just want you to take a look at the skies in these and how these are so softly colored and the clouds vary. This was all part of the artistic license that the colorists were taking um, to make these postcard views beautiful. Here is a really interesting postcard that is based on a design drawing of the Ringlings mansion that is not the final design. And this to me is really curious that this image was somehow in circulation despite it not being 
the final architectural design that was executed. So the Ringlings, John and Mabel, worked with Earl Purdy, an architect, on this um, earlier design of Cadizan. And we at the Ringling were able to acquire this several years ago. And it's in our collection. It's not currently on view. But if you look closely at the staircase leading down to the dock, this is not what the final staircase looks like. There were a number of modifications made to this design by Dwight James Baum. And in the postcard you see next to it, you can see the colorist were either instructed or took creative liberties to make the Cotizan a very pretty pink color that it is not in real life. <laughs> so we have the terracotta tones in the original drawing, but perhaps, um, a local distributor had access to this image and then commissioned this postcard company, J.V. Hartman, out of Portland, Maine and Tampa, Florida to create this postcard and um, make it for sale at corner stores across Sarasota. And we have another example in a slightly different colorway um, with the, the postmark 1929 on this. So this is another one of our earlier postcards. And as our research is ongoing, I'm hoping to determine how this image came to be um, in circulation. So the garden facing facade of Cartesian is also featured on a number of postcard designs. This postcard is postmarked from 1949 and has a lovely um, note on the back that is really great for giving us insights into the tourists coming uh, to Sarasota. So the writer says, we saw Wikiwachi Springs yesterday. This is still one of Florida's roadside attractions that uh, many visitors go to even to this day. And the writer goes on to say, took every road except 41 and didn't get lost. So 41 is one of these main thoroughfares going through Florida. And it's interesting that this person chose not to take the new freeway at the time. And he also goes on to say they saw the Wrigley Circus and we'll see the museum and then the cot is on tomorrow. So very short note, but still it gives us um, a little more insight into what, how tourists were behaving in the past. We have a number of interior views of the Cotizan, and these are particularly useful to me in getting a sense of the various ways the furniture, the decor, and the collection were installed in Cotizan. So we're looking at three different views of um, what we call the court today, but it's been called a number of different names over the years from the Great Hall to the living room. And you can see um, the organ console for the Aeolian organ, portrait of John Ringling. There's a number of pieces from the Gavet collection on view and furniture that's original to the Ringlings that survives to this day, um, including a partner's desk and the grand piano. Um, so for me, these are really great for me to get a sense of how this room has been interpreted in different periods and that this is a fluid space, that the furniture and its placement isn't set in stone and there isn't one right or wrong way to install the space, but there have been a number of interpretations over the years. We are um, continuing to acquire postcards in the archives and while many have been given over the years as gifts and donations, when we see a postcard that we do not currently have in our holdings, we um, will try to purchase it. And this is one that we just acquired. It's a, one of the real photograph postcards that to me is exciting to look at because of its dating to a very early period when our first museum director changed um, the decor up in Cotizan. So in order to refresh the space, Chick Austin um, led a bit of a redecorating campaign where he wallpapered the ballroom and the reception room that you can see here. 
and this was to liven it up. But um, it's an important record for us to have to see how these spaces have changed over time. And we have a number of these real photograph postcards in the Rinkman's archives, including a number of views of the Museum of Art's courtyard. And to me, I'm especially drawn to these images because they capture a level of detail and accuracy that goes beyond the um, idealized and romanticized colored views and the linen postcards. And I'm just starting to dig into the different producers of these. Two of these are um, marked with the company's name, W.M. Klein of Chattanooga, Tennessee. And others don't have the um, company recorded, but we're hoping to find comparables in other collections in order to better document these and date them. But just to give you a sense of the breadth of the kinds of views we have in the collection and that contrasting aesthetic, um, we're gonna look at, we're gonna have some of these on view in the Cotizon. So as a contrasting aesthetic, you can see the linen postcard views of the entrance to the Museum of Art and here are a few views of the sculpture in the courtyards. These views are very, to me, I interpret them as very peaceful and quiet and offering a refuge and escape from the busy world. And I think that is very much part of the intention of these postcards and part of their attraction. They also have both daytime and nighttime views of the courtyard. And while today I sense that I'm looking at these with my postmodern eyes, this nostalgia looking back to a simpler time perhaps, there's um, really a lot of different lenses that you can look at these through. And I think they're, they are open to various modes of interpretation versus one way of looking at these. But I personally see these as miniature works of art and as a form of democratic art because these were so affordable. You could buy these for just a few cents or a pack um, of these as a group of views and then you could mail them for one penny. So they were very inexpensive and accessible. And if you take time to look at the details, you can see wonderful um, artistic interpretations of these spaces. This is one of my favorite views of the museum courtyard. And it's just this beautifully rendered depiction of the reflecting pool that's right um, below the David sculpture with these uh, black swans at the edge and the beautiful reflections of the flowers in bloom around the courtyard. I just, again, think about the colorist working in the art department at Kurt Tyke and Company in Chicago. And to create all of this beautiful detail and color, I just think this in itself is a work of art, even though it's just three and a half by five and a half piece of paper. We have a number of postcards that highlight the sculpture on view in the courtyard. And this is a lovely rendition of the Fountain of the Turtles. So if you take a look at this present day image of the fountain, you can see what this looks like in real life if you were to stand in front of it today. And this is a sculpture by Fonderia Chirazzi. They are an Italian firm that John Ringling bought a number of reproductions of Italian, famous Italian sculpture from Italy. And so the Fountain of the Turtles, the original is actually in Rome and you can visit it to this day um, in one of Rome's squares. And our postcard rendition of it, I think takes a really beautiful dreamy quality of this view versus the reality, the way the colorist had changed the shells to give them that beautiful shading. It's to me, an idealized view of this image. And it's amazing to see how the colorist manipulated this image to achieve that uh, view. The loggias of the courtyard framing um, 
the museum are also found on a number of different views of postcards. And here you can see a real photo postcard and a very similar linen postcard. And I'm showing these side by side just so you can get a sense again of the different aesthetic trends going on in postcard production and also to think about the visual consumption of the landscape. Like to this day, when we have visitors and tourists come by the thousands to the Ringling, this is one of the quintessential photos people take and post on their Instagram or Facebook or um, share with friends and family. And before cameras were widely used by tourists, and even when they were starting to be used mid-century, um, buying a postcard was still a great way to have a memento and a souvenir. And this image, this view is just a perennial favorite. So I think it's amazing to see this here that you see two very tranquil views, you know, devoid of humans. Um, but um, we think about the tourist gaze and how that continues to today. It's just an interesting way to frame these images. Also, these um, kinds of postcards that you see here, greetings from Sarasota, Florida, these are still made today um, with a, a lot of photos combined in the letters. And you can see in the R of Sarasota, the Oceanus sculpture from the courtyard is featured among a number of other vignettes in Sarasota. And this postcard was mailed in 1941. And is a lovely note from a grandfather to his two grandchildren. So it's a wonderful slice of history. There also are Reekling um, Museum, the courtyard images, combined with other roadside attractions of Sarasota and Sarasota Jungle Gardens, one of our neighboring institutions nearby is featured on this split postcard. And this is one that was made um, by a Boston competitor of Kurt Tyke and is distributed by Emmy Russell. And if you've been reading the little labels below the postcards, most of our postcards were distributed by this local publisher. So um, it's a name and a company that I'm hoping to explore in more detail to look into the kinds of commissions and orders this company made. And just to give you a little bit of a broader sense of the kinds of postcards, they're not all these quiet scenes of the art museum. There are also lots of populated scenes in uh, postcards, like the ones you see here of sunbathers on the beach and uh, more people at Lido Casino, which um, is actually no longer in existence. So this is a wonderful record of that place. Um, and these postcard images are available to look at on Florida Memories website. So that's another wonderful research resource to look at postcards from this era. And also in case you want to digitally send a postcard to friends, you can do so on Sarasota History Alive's website. And I've sent a couple from here and they have a wonderful variety of postcards that have been digitized that you can email to people. So that is my talk for today. And I just want to say thanks for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, from the audience and also I'll just plug my Instagram and Trepa Curator in case you want to see more images and follow along what we're what's going on at the Cotizan in the museum. So thank you. Looks like Sally's got a question. Sally, go ahead. Uh, yeah, a, a couple of things I noticed. Um, first of all, um, when they're in the scenes of the from the water side of the Ka, um, and I can't remember which one of the several that you showed, but it showed the beach to the left or or um, north of the house, and the and a wall to the south of the house. And I 
I was a little confused because I thought, Laura, in our training, we had it the other way around. Let's see if I can find the one. Was it the aerial view? Is that what you were thinking of? Well, there it does show in the aerial view a beach. I can see, I can't tell if that's a wall or what that is or a walk. But there was no, that's... one later, I think, that showed. Okay. Um, yeah, as I look at these postcards, I find right myself there. there. Here? So mm -hmm. you have the wall on the north, the one on the left. You okay. have a wall on the right, decidedly. And then it looks like it's more gradual. Do you agree on the, I mean, on yeah. the, on the left? And a wall on the yeah. right. But we don't know, you, you don't know the date of that. Right. I think something it's to keep different. in mind with looking yeah. at these. It's great yeah. to notice those kinds of details and then go in person and look at these places and see, does yeah. this survive? Is this original? Or was this part of the manipulation and the changes they were making yes. based yeah. on and, the client? You certainly can't study the landscape from these colored pictures, yeah. right? Because they weren't there. The people coloring them weren't there. Yes, but they were given instructions. So some records survived from Kurt okay. Tice's company. Of They had a whole network of sales agents and photographers. And okay. just, it was a huge production. And there's a, there's a lot more detail that I didn't go into about what went into making these because I wanted to focus on the imagery today. But there's right. a lot of sleuthing you can do as an art okay. historian or as a layperson or anybody and compare these things. I've seen some images of the Museum of Art entrance where the wall is much higher than it is today. And a part of me wants to know, has, has the wall changed? Has it been lowered and redesigned? Or hmm. was that just something they manipulated in the design of the postcard? So questions like that are great and will take a little more digging to see um, if we have other forms of documentation to support or. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Marissa, I think there was also a question that came through the chat um, when you were looking at the Museum of Art images. If you can go forward a little bit, one of the images. Okay. Loja, um, there was just a question about where that was located. Um, yeah. Which? Oh, yeah, right there, the one on the far right. Oh, okay. Hold on. Is that the. It's hard to make out. I assume that's the courtyard there. Uh, yes. That is the wall with the David, right? We're looking at this image on the far right. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. It looks like it's looking out. So if you're looking out towards the water, so from what if you exit the museum and walk through that main entrance and walk into the loggia, it's from that wing. But are, are you seeing stairs in front of that column? Hmm. You know, that's, that's a good question. I mean, like right here at the base, like you yeah. step down. Yeah, I think we can't get a sense of the depth from this image, um, possibly due to the process of producing this photograph. Um, yeah, you guys have eagle eyes, hawk eyes today. This is great. I'm so glad. I wanted to encourage closer looking and I'm going to have to look at these more closely myself because every time I look at them, I see more details and it notice. It look like we're looking to the west and yeah, what this looks we're like looking at in front of us is the wall on which the David stands. However, yeah. we're not looking at the portion of the wall where the David is located. Right. So at this period, it's interesting because this area here was what the Ringlings originally had planned to have as their tomb. And yeah. that was never actually executed, but that space is still there underneath this walkway. For me, it's interesting to see all of the palm trees here and all um, the greenery that has definitely changed over the years. And we recently restored these um, hanging lanterns that hang in the really loggias that are original. The postcard images that showed all of the flowering plants in the courtyard. Yeah. Uh, it yeah. made me wish we could have uh, all of those flowers there today, although <laughs> I'm sure the grounds maintenance crew would not agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is interesting to see. I would love to look at these. I showed some of these to our um, 
horticulturalist Kai um, just so he could see the history of the gardens. And he maintains the Mabel's Rose Garden and it works with a whole team of people on the property to keep this state looking beautiful. And we recently achieved arboretum status. So there's lots of gorgeous things to explore nature at the Ringling. But these, you know, obviously show that there was great care taken in the plantings, in the potted plants and the garden hedges at the time. So maybe we can do more seasonal plantings down the road. It's definitely fun to see the way things progress over the years. Yeah. Um, I've got a question, Marissa. Uh, mm -hmm. So for the cards that were produced um, before 1946, when the museum sort of like fully opened, um, obviously some of those are um, were produced by people other than the museum itself. Do we know if the museum was selling souvenir items when it was opening periodically, um, like before John's death? Um, and do any of those like souvenir cards exist? That is a great question. Um, I've definitely come across some souvenir books in the archives that seem to be produced by the Ringling, um, but I haven't studied them in great depth yet, just kind of flipped through them and seen a lot of the images we've seen today, both in linen postcards and real photo postcards. And they're not really great at being photographed because they are bound, small little, um, souvenir books. So I wasn't able to include any, but it does appear that the Ringling sold some of these kinds of souvenir ephemera. So if you want to see some of these in person, you could definitely set up an appointment with our archivist once we are able to have the public visit the archives again. And I'd be happy to take a closer look at those and they definitely deserve further research and analysis. Any other, Any other questions? Not a question, but just a comment. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. It was really fun to look at all of these old images and see um, the way the ringling was presented. I love the black swans. What, a, what yeah. a treat. I wonder, were there really black swans there, or was this just artistic license? Well, I have seen some, yeah, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate that. I have seen some real photographs with swans there, not necessarily in this exact same posturing, but yes, <laughs> apparently there were black swans here on the property. Very cool. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you, you all. So this was wonderful and we, I'm sure we will all be eagerly um, waiting to see the postcards when they're installed and to, to learn more from you as you continue to research this. So we really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you.